Welcome back to another episode of Bitfinex Talks. I'm your host, Ricardo Martinez. Today, my guest is Adam Simmons, who's the Chief Marketing Officer at Radix. And this is Adam's second time on the show. He was one of my very first interviews when we kicked off the Bitfinex Talks podcast. So uh, I want to give him a warm welcome and say thanks for coming back, Adam. How are you today? I'm good. It's a pleasure to be back. As we were talking about pre-show, um, I can't believe it's been a year. Like crypto time, time flies, and uh, you, yeah, can't believe it's been so long and so such a short time simultaneously. Yeah, it certainly does fly. Uh, a couple of weeks in crypto feels like six months. So, to have you back on the show, you're our first recurring guest, so that's awesome. And then, secondly. Um, the first time you were here, you came on to talk about Radix. Uh, some of our viewers may not know what Radix is. Would you mind giving us like a quick recap on what the Radix project is trying to accomplish? Yeah, so Radix is a layer one smart contract platform. So in, in some ways, it's similar to things like Ethereum, Solana, Nia, um, Sui, et cetera. The big difference with Radix is we've been going for just over 10 years now. Um, it started off as an R&D project. We spent a lot of time really going back and looking at every single layer of what's needed to be delivered technologically to create a Web3 and DeFi experience that's suitable for really mass adoption. What's changed in the last year since we last spoke is that we've gone live with our full stack. So when we last spoke, our Olympia network was live, which was the first version of our uh, proof of stake consensus mechanism. It allowed some simple sends and stuff, but no smart contracts. The wallet was pretty basic. Um, and I believe when we last spoke, we'd just done our RadFi keynote event and shown off a bunch of cool stuff that was coming. Well, a lot of that cool stuff has now come. It came out at the end of September. The migration and upgrade went really, really well. And so that's all running now. You can now deploy Scripto smart contracts on Radix, which Scripto is a Rust-based programming language. And you can now use the Radix mobile wallet, which is only possible thanks to a whole bunch of different things in the technology stack that allows us to give a far better user experience for anyone trying to use crypto today. So the upgrade, as I understand it, is called the Babylon upgrade. Um, you mentioned that there's crypto-based smart contracts. Does that mean that we're going to see a DAP uh, ecosystem like kind of built on top of Radix now? Yeah, so um, I can also happily say you are already able to see a DAP ecosystem being built on Radix. So uh, the upgrade as the time of recording uh, only happened literally under a week ago. We already have uh, two DEXs live. We have some NFT marketplaces getting ready to set up and go um, and a whole bunch of other projects uh, that are in the process of getting testing, getting their kind of final contracts audited and going live. So for me, I'm someone who's always worked in platform based businesses, like how you build ecosystems and this this is one of the most exciting periods of any kind of project for me because it really is the moment where any day you can wake up and be like hey the next big thing just went live and you had no idea where it was coming and so there's loads of stuff that i i know that's coming we've got some cool dexes and stuff coming out that are doing some really innovative things but there's tons of stuff which even a few months ago when we started our uh, babylon booster grants program that came out the woodwork for me and like i'm pretty plugged into everything going on obviously uh, on radix and there were some people who are like hey, what are you doing? And we'd never heard the name before. They'd never popped up. I'm like, oh, yeah, I've just been tinkering and building stuff on the test net and stuff. Uh, this is my project. And we're like, oh, that's great. That's great. Have you done a demo of this yet? Like, what stage are you at? And they're like, oh, yeah, here. And they showed us a working version on our test net with a front-end UI and everything else. And there were loads of those. So we reckon there's around about 50 projects that we know of at the moment that are already going to go live. And there's a bunch more popping up all the time. So it's a super exciting time. It's a really easy time to get involved as well with the the new wallet experience. is very intuitive and easy to use. So it's a great time to come and play um, and see a whole new ecosystem being born. Nice. Uh, the last time we spoke about a year ago, you were going on and on about how much better Scripto is um, for writing smart contracts. Can you kind of recap a little bit the advantages that Scripto smart contracts give you over traditional smart contracting languages? Yes, I, I, I'd love to. Uh, firstly, apologies to anyone who remembers this from the last time, because I'm probably going to use similar analogies, uh, because they're just good ones. So Scripto is a Rust-based programming language, um, and it allows developers to program the Radix engine. So Radix, as a network, isn't EVM compatible. We build our own virtual machine. And one of the big reasons for that is that the way we handle assets, be that tokens, NFT, 
badges, any kind of uh, asset on chain, they behave much more like physical objects rather than um, just balances in a, a ledger in an ERC-20 contract, for example. Now, this gives, for a start, some really big security benefits in what is possible to be able to be done, but it also makes it way more intuitive to build because when you think of something like a decentralized exchange or an NFT marketplace, the way you would imagine it working isn't that complicated. You put like one token in and another token comes out. And you're like, oh, okay, I can imagine that is like going to an airport and being at a currency exchange and putting some dollars on and getting euros back or vice versa. In reality, it happens in, in message-based systems or EVM-based systems far different from that. What I, rather than actually putting physical objects on the counter, it you are just signing something to allow a smart contract to update your balance of a token in another smart contract on your behalf. And even on a simple thing like just a token A to token B swap, that's already getting a lot more complicated than you'd imagine of just tokens moving in there and coming out the other side back into your account. On Radix, it works exactly like that. They are physical, they behave like physical assets. And so the other way I describe this is it's very, the Radix engine and Scripto together are very much like a game engine for Web3 or DeFi. And that is not restrictive. So Radix is completely Turing complete. You can build anything, you can code anything with it for the developers know what, what Turing complete means. Just the same as a game engine. It's just a lot of stuff is built in and parameterized in a really easy way to go live. So if you want to create a new token, you don't need to go and deploy a new ERC, whatever smart contract. You just say, hey, mint token with these parameters and it goes. So in the same way as a game engine, you might be like, hey, I wanna make a game, but my game's in space. You just turn the gravity slider down to zero. You can do those sort of things. So like, is, is a token, your token on Radix, is it fungible? Is it non-fungible? Is it burnable? Does it have a limited supply? Does it have um, a supply that can be changed? You can make all of that as rules within there. The other benefit of this is that because that's all built in, all the other areas of the network natively understand what this means. So that makes from like a user interface level, it really easy for Radix to be able to show end users this sort of information. So for example, say you have an asset in your, your Radix wallet, you can click on it and see like, is this asset recallable? Is it freezable? Is it burnable? And these are things which are actually really quite common. So there's many assets um, today that people think like, oh, it's, it's a, a decentralized asset, nothing can ever happen with them. They don't actually realize those assets can be frozen um, or their, their assets in their account can be frozen, but that's built into the smart contract. Whereas on Radix, that's really easy to display if that is there and also if it isn't. Not just at that point, but also if it could ever be added. So little things like that is when we say that the, the uh, many of the user interface and user experience benefits we give in the Radix wallet are exclusively possible on Radix. It's because it's not just a pretty UI, it's leveraging things that go all the way down the technology stack. Aside from, from crypto-based contracts, uh, or smart contracts, what other um, things were included with the Babylon upgrade? Yeah, so uh, obviously the big one was script on the Radix engine, smart contracts and dApps coming to Radix. The other big one was the new Radix wallet. So the new Radix wallet, as I said, it's a mobile first wallet available now on iOS and Android. And that has a whole bunch of features that leverage the rest of the stack. So kind of one of the headline ones to give an example is the transaction preview. So when you make a transaction on the Radix wallet, it doesn't just show you like a, a hashed transaction. It actually shows you what's gonna happen in a very pretty human readable way. And it does that because all transactions on the Radix network, when they go to the, when they're submitted basically through the Radix engine are a transaction manifest. They describe the intent of what's going to happen. And then the wallet can easily pass that and make that very visible to whoever's using it. So you actually see like, oh, you're withdrawing, X amount of this token from your account, it's going through this DAP and it's going to deposit back this amount of token into that account. Do you accept that? That is all completely human readable and means that blind signing is just not a thing on Radix. There's also a whole bunch of other features so like in there as well, you can set a guarantee on that transaction. So say you're doing a token swap or buying an NFT or you're like, hey, I wanna buy this, but it's gotta be for at least that price. You can actually set in the wallet and in the transaction manifest, very intuitively, if I don't get at least 90% of what's estimated for this transaction, it fails. 
Now, unlike in many dApps where that is something that would have to be done at the UI level and built individually into every single smart contract that wanted to do that, and the user has to trust that whoever deployed that smart contract did it right, it's going to work and compose well with any other dApps it's working with. On Radix, that's built in at the engine level. So actually, the transaction just isn't going to work if that guarantee isn't met. So that gives you more security. Other big things that came is obviously Radix Connect. So Radix Connect is the way that you can use desktop-based applications um, with your Radix wallet. So it's not the same as something like Wallet Connect. Your phone and the wallet on your phone is still the secure device. So what you do is there's a, there's a Chrome extension. You connect it. It's like magic. You scan a QR code. And then it's like, OK, I'm connected to the phone. That is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, peer -peer connection. Um, completely encrypted. And when you interact with the dApp, it just pushes the confirmation to your phone. So you're not sharing your seed, your, your keys or anything actually onto that extension. It just means that you can interact with that. The other thing that came with that Radix Connect is personas. So personas are Radix's version of Web3 pass keys, essentially. So what this is, it's, it's a login for dApps. And that separates your account address, which is what you own, from who you are. And so you can, by using Radix Connect, when you log into a dApp, you can have any combination of that. You could share one persona, which could have information you choose to share with the dApp or the operator of the dApp, as well as the account you have. And you can have any combination of those. So you could have one persona connected and multiple accounts, or one account connected and have different personas. So an example of this is you might have, say, um, Two personas. I could have my my Adam Simmons persona, which I use to connect to in the future my government tax system or to an exchange or whatever. Because hey, that's me. I, I want to be a real human. And then I could have like Adam Gamer as another persona, which doesn't have my address on it or something else. I could have another one for my e-commerce or if I want to go and buy something online that's got my shipping address. But I don't want that person to have my passport number. All of these things are in a persona, and they're separated from your account. And that information is very intuitive to use, not only for users, but also for developers to bring in, which opens up a whole bunch of really cool use cases uh, that we're already starting to see go live. The persona idea sounds really, really interesting, how you can kind of compartmentalize your privacy like, and decide what you want to reveal to the different dApps yep. and services that you interact with. That's awesome. As far as like the these new features that the crypto smart contracts allow for, are, do you expect to see like new kinds of Web three um, like DApps and stuff that that can't currently exist on other Web three platforms due to limitations that crypto doesn't have? So that's a really cool question, um, and it's it's a horrible one to have to answer as a CMO because the short answer to that is. Most other smart contract platforms, say like Ethereum, for example, you can build anything there. They're completely Turing complete. So there's there's nothing which you can be like, hey, that could only be built on Radix. What I'd say is it's much more like that game engine analogy. So it's like, sure, you can build any video game in binary if you wanted to, or in assembly if you want to do that. It would be incredibly challenging. It's going to have loads of errors. But yeah, you could if you're able to go and do that. But every good game that's basically ever been made in the in the current times was built using a game engine because it makes it so much quicker and easier to work on the stuff you want to work on. And that's really what Scripto and Radix Engine do for developers, along with things like the UI level stuff. Like take guarantees, for example, in transactions. Now, if you're building a DEX, because the wallet does guarantees, you don't have to worry about building in systems for slippage in your DEX if you don't want to, because the wallet does that for you. That's already built in. If you're launching an NFT, you don't have to be like, oh, I need to make a new smart contract for every new NFT collection I launch. I just define this new asset with its metadata that automatically gets pulled into the wallet because the wallet understands that's an asset and knows to look for that metadata and present it correctly. So it's really less about being a case of, hey, this unlocks things that wouldn't be possible on other networks. It's about making all of those things far easier to build and to use for both developers and their, their end users, which ultimately means you get more cool dApps being built quicker. It's a lower cost barrier, it's a lower effort barrier, it's a lower talent barrier for what you're building, which means users have more things they can play with. And for example, we're already seeing that. So even before Radix uh, went live with the Babylon upgrade, where smart contracts could be deployed on mainnet, we had Scripto in early access. And one of the examples I, I absolutely, there's actually two. Uh, the first one is that we had a developer from another chain that I won't name um, who found out about us doing a competition 
for uh, building a script app. It wasn't a huge amount of money. It was like, hey, uh, build uh, some kind of a Petrels application. They came into our developer channels literally three days before the competition ended, asked a few questions, disappeared again, didn't hear from them. We're like, ah, oh, maybe they bounced out. And then on the last day before the competition closed, a couple of days later, they submitted a working Petrels app in three days. They found out of Radix and then came third in this competition. Another one, uh, there's someone else in our community who had never been a professional developer. They'd never coded. They, they weren't a developer in like their full-time job. They just really like Radix. And because it's Scripto is Rust-based, they're like, hey, I want to learn how to do this. Again, a year later, they're making production-grade dApps. Now, I challenge anyone to take someone who has never coded before and within one year, have them making production grade dApps using Solidity, for example. It just doesn't happen. And so this lowering the barrier to entry, really our goal is if you get more developers and more entrepreneurs building cool things, that's more things for users to go and interact with. The more things there's users to interact with, the more dApps that come out because they either spark innovation or there's interoperability between them or ways to bolt on top of that. And because of this game engine-like um, system with Radix Engine and Scripto and the full stack approach we've taken, it just means that you can create stuff a lot quicker and get that ecosystem growing a lot faster than you could elsewhere. Wow, that's super impressive. Uh, how has the developer community reacted to to like this lowering of the barrier to entry and like user friendliness that Scripto provides? So, really well. Ultimately, like we're still early in Radix. The, you can only deploy smart contracts recently. There's a whole ton of really powerful stuff going. And these are businesses that still need to grow. But what we're seeing is a huge sway of really cool things being built. So uh, to shout out a couple of DEXs, for example, there's the three that uh, are live at the moment. We've got uh, Caviar, Caviar 9, we've got Aussie Swap, and we've got DeFi Plaza. DeFi Plaza was also live on Ethereum previously. Um, if you look at those, they are not just simple kind of Uniswap v2 clones of just like a simple uh, A times B equals K algorithm. They're doing some really cool things. So Caviar's got some order book features, limit order features. Uh, Aussie Swap is running um, things beyond what Uni v3 can do in terms of concentrated liquidity. DeFi Plaza is doing like multi pool pools um, with very efficient trading between them. All of those are in the first version. So this isn't a case of this ecosystem and developers here being like, hey, what's the simplest thing I can make here? Because it's so easy to build. They're like, actually, we can build really innovative features that some of the biggest companies and other chains are only just doing or specializing in just a fraction of that. Developers on Radix are able to do that and more because it's so intuitive to build. It also means that they're not having to worry about the other end of the spectrum, which anyone who's ever been involved in a, a business or a dap or a startup knows the hard part isn't just the technology how do you onboard users how do you get uh, product market fit with radix we take so much out of what you have to worry about there you don't have to be going educating your users of being like oh we've got a new dex and you're going to get an lp token back but if you want to see that lp token in your wallet you've got to go and add the contract address otherwise it doesn't show up meaning all that support burden goes away. You don't have to go, oh, yeah, when you blind sign that transaction, I promise it's doing the right thing. It's intuitive. On Radix, all of these things just lower the barrier to not only building really cool projects and really cool dApps, but it also lowers the barrier to educate and onboard and retain users. And that's what I believe is the secret source we've got going, is it's not just one side of this. Both sides are very symbiotic into growing an ecosystem. And we're already seeing that work fantastically with the stuff going live so incredibly quickly on the platform. When we last spoke, forgive me if this has changed in the year since we last spoke, but you mentioned that the Radix engine was like kind of its standalone smart contract engine and that it doesn't really integrate with like other EVM based Web3 chains. Has there been any progress made like for bridges or, or any way to connect the Radix ecosystem with the wider Web3 ecosystem? Yeah, so I think they're they're two different questions. So in terms of EVM compatibility, no. The Radix, the Radix chain and the Radix engine is not EVM compatible and it can't be. They're completely different ways of operating. Um, and we we made that decision early because while it makes it a little bit more challenging in the early stage, you can't just copy paste over some Solidity code um, and get it live. Actually, what we find is that once, once people understand the asset oriented way of building on radix it's far more intuitive and actually rebuilding the functionality is way way 
easier and then growing on top of that then the slight barrier being like you can't just copy and paste solidity over however that doesn't mean cross-chain bridging isn't super important we're going to live in a multi-chain world for the foreseeable future at least and that's not a crypto unique thing if you look at any kind of platform or marketplace based business ever that's what you see you see someone come and prove that technology an innovator in the space be that YouTube, be that uh, Ask Jeeves, uh, they may not actually have been the first, but again, the, the quote always goes there that you're like, Google was the 16th search engine. You see massive proliferation of a technology until the, the product market fit of someone gets too far ahead of the competition and things just work and they're able to capture enough market share, often not by capitalizing on moving existing markets onto them, but by actually just growing the number, the total user base. Then you see generally a bit of a um, contraction of the number of competitors in the space with a couple of like leaders in their own respective areas and that usually stabilizes in the long term so in crypto we're still only just coming over like the innovator stage in terms of smart contract platforms there was ethereum there's been a couple of like second gen and now with the third gen ones we're really seeing which i'd include radix in sui etc that's all really coming is like, hey, they solved a lot of the fundamental problems that are really difficult to fix. So again, it's not like for like, but a lot of the things that you're seeing on Ethereum, like account abstraction, that's just built into Radix. It's a native function. And the difference is the reason we're able to do that is because our plane wasn't in the air. Um, <laughs> on something like Ethereum, you're like, hey, we've got, the, we've got a simple biplane going. Now we want to attach a jet engine to it while in flight and we can't land. It's super hard. If you've got the advantage of having a look and going, hey, flying's really cool. What do we do? It's not just strapping an engine onto the biplane. There's a hundred thousand different things that you need to improve along with that. And then you take off, you're in a much stronger position. Um, so in terms of this multi-chain world, you need to be able to bridge assets. So the two kind of big things in the ecosystem is one coming live fairly soon will be the InstaBridge service. That's a centralized bridging solution. Um, that's going to be offering uh, both the ability to bridge uh, Radix tokens from Ethereum, uh, which is EXRD, over to uh, the main net still. Uh, that's something they provided uh, during the Olympia network, but also wrapped assets. So uh, forgive me if I don't remember this exactly, but it's like it's going to have wrapped BTC, wrapped ETH, wrapped USDC, and I think a couple of other things um, in its first launch. You then also have... Um, since I believe we last spoke, uh, Layer Zero have announced that they're going to be integrating with Radix. So uh, that integration obviously opens up a lot of opportunity for uh, cross-chain messaging and bridging. So uh, keep eye an eye out for more news on that. I can't tell you uh, much more other than they've announced they're going to be supporting it at the moment. And then, of course, it's it's not uh, necessarily directly bridging, but obviously exchange partners um, such as yourselves um, obviously do offer the ability to bridge between chains. And I'm sure as we start seeing more markets for more assets on Radix um, and demand for wrapped assets and, and other assets there, we'll see that continue to grow um, both from centralized exchanges, um, bridges, centralized bridges, and also decentralized bridges. Aside from, from the DEXs that you mentioned, um, you mentioned like a flurry of 50 other dApps that have been built so far within a week. Like what kind of dApps are they? Like, are, are we seeing DeFi offerings? Uh, you mentioned NFT platforms. Like what kind of dApps can we expect to see on Radix? So really we're, we're pretty much at the stage now where most of the major categories that you can think of within kind of say the ethereum ecosystem we're seeing replicated so there's um uh, no no favoritism here so i'll try and chat out quite a few um but for example there's radix domains which is doing similar and more to what um ENS does. We've got obviously DEXs that are doing things similar to uh, it's a broad category. So obviously you've got things like Uniswap v3 with concentrated liquidity, order book exchanges, um, futures exchanges. Um, native to Radix is also um, liquid staking, uh, but we're seeing some cool things with how liquid staking derivatives um, can be made as well. And that's coming live. We've got uh, Web3 gaming applications coming through. We've got NFT marketplaces, obviously NFT collections. There's also some really cool stuff. So like uh, a, one that I think is really, really awesome that's being built is a project called Trove. And Trove is a, a trading platform um, for anything. So you can put up a bid or a, an offer or an ask. Um, so you can be like, hey, I want to trade these tokens, this NFT and something else for this amount of that token, or, hey, I've got this NFT, put up offers for what you want to do. And it's like a um, asynchronous trading, um, like OTC kind of trades. And that's a cool thing, which is just getting built. There's a, there's a whole bunch of other things being built. There's some uh, cool um, 
gambling style applications as well being produced. Really, there's every every category you can think of. There's something coming. And for anything there isn't, I'd say if you're listening and you find something missing, well, hey, you've just found yourself a potential really good business opportunity. Uh, get started learning Scripto. It's super simple. Do you still have the call to action for developers that uh, want to get involved with the Scripto smart contracting language and start building on Radix? And if so, how can they do so? Yeah, so it's super simple. There's two things you can do on Radix. You can go and build and you can go and use. So radixdlt.com, uh, right at the top, you've got those two options. Also, you can learn more about kind of the full stack we've got going on. But yeah, builders, we've got a bunch of really cool programs. So uh, at the moment, we've got our Babylon Booster Grants in flow. So these are people who uh, applied that they're going to be aiming to go live within uh, six weeks of Babylon upgrade completing, which has just happened. So that's going out. We'll have more news on more programs coming up. Uh, we've got things like the Scripto 101 Academy, which has loads of information there. Our developer documentation uh, is something of a pet project of our CTO that he wants to have the best uh, developer documentation in the space and is on a mission to make that the case. And we've had some really good feedback on there. So if you're building, there's some cool stuff there. We have the developer program as well, where uh, depending on hitting different milestones, you can uh, get some incentives in XRD, which is the native token of Radex. Um, and obviously there's just a fun builder community as well. Like this is something that we've really tried to foster uh, since we put Scripto in early access is a grassroots approach. So we've had people do like a uh, Scripto class one oh uh, Scripto class of 2023 um, on our Discord channel. We've had little groups build up and being like, hey, let's learn Scripto together. Let's and these are people who are not even coders, all the way up to people who have had successful dApps on other chains, being like, hey, I want to pick up Scripto and have a go. And the thing that we keep hearing back is that the asset oriented approach to this is so intuitive, the building just becomes the easy part. And that, that's our goal. It's like, we want the easy part of launching a project on Radix to be the smart contract coding. So that people who are building these cool applications and these cool projects can spend their time not battling code, but actually building a great project, a great community and a great user base. Would you like to give uh, Radix's information, like as far as like the website, social media and all that kind of thing for our, our listeners? Yeah, so um, if you can't remember this, just Google Radix. Um, I'm glad to say that we've got pretty good SEO. So you will, we will come up pretty close there. Um, you might get a Wikipedia entry first for the uh, Latin meaning of the word, which is root, um, depending on your region. But yeah, you'll find Radix easily there. But the full URL is radixdlt.com. Um, in there, um, as I said, there's three options in the nav bar. Use, build, learn. Um, use any of those. That's got all the links to all the different socials and community channels. And we've got a brilliant community willing to help people out, answer questions. And uh, myself and others in the team are always around there to, to get involved. Well, Adam, thank you so much for coming back on the show and telling us about the Babylon upgrade and all the new and interesting developments that have been happening within the Radix ecosystem. Thank you very much for having me again, Ricardo. And thanks, everyone, for listening.